Hello and welcome to Across the Common Line, a podcast series where we all talk things space. I'm Ahlam and today we have the celebrated Mr. Jean Claude Vecchiato. He works at international law firm Bird and Bird and he is currently a partner in their finance and financial regulation group the head of their aviation, space and defense team in Paris and co-head of their global space and satellite group. Over the years, he spent more than a year, a decade in house and 10 years in international law firms, giving him rare expertise and inside knowledge of the aerospace industry. We are delighted to have you join us for our podcast series and and are thanking you very much for recording this series again. Um, I have a few questions for you to start with and we could build on from there. Um, Can you, briefly introduce yourself and tell us about the work you do. Yes, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to participate to this broadcast. Um, So my name is Jean-Claude Vecchiato. I'm a partner at Bird & Bird. Um, And as you said, I'm leading leading the international space and satellite practice. Um, So Bird & Bird is an international law firm. We have more than 1,300 lawyers around the world in 29 offices. Um, and this is a truly international firm, not just a London-based. We, our main office is in London, but the, the, the firm is managed by partners from all around the world. Uh, it was founded in the 19th century, in the UK, and then ex- expanded in Europe and, uh, and then in the world. So it's the Bird & Bird is a firm focusing on technology. Our strategy is to support companies changed by technology. So it's a bit unique uh, as a law firm because usually law firm focus on practices like commercial, M&A, finance, litigation, but not on on technology. And we also have a a, a clear focus on sectors. So we have different sectors, one of them being um, aviation, defense and space. So space is a real sector. And we have lawyers um, who have, some of them, uh, like myself, have in-house experience. So real knowledge of the, uh, the, the technology and the, the industry and the activity. So I worked um, before that, I worked, as you said, 15 years at Airbus. Uh, so Airbus generally, not just the commercial aviation, because usually you know the Airbus, the aircraft, but Airbus also has uh, different uh, divisions, one of them being uh, defense and space, where they build satellites in particular and a few other things. And they're also um, shareholder of uh, Ariane Group building the Ariane rocket. So, you know, it's a, it's a very large um, activity. So I was in charge of international projects and financings, and this is where I really discovered uh, space. I worked on major projects in uh, in various countries. In the UK, I worked on the Skynet 5 um, military communication um, uh, constellation. Uh, I also worked on uh, Galileo, who's the, which is the European uh, geo-positioning uh, constellation. I worked on this when, a you know, long time ago now, when it was to be a public-private partnership with the European Commission. And at that time, I was leading the negotiations uh, for the the legal aspects and the risk aspects of this this constellation. Um, I also worked on a a lot of other uh, space uh, projects and and military projects. How did you get involved with space law? Was it your time at EADS, UniDroit, that inspired you to specialize in it? I I discovered space law when I joined uh, Airbus. At the time it was called EADS, as you mentioned, so European Aeronautic defense and space company. But it was a bit complex. So they, they decided to rebrand it into Airbus, which, is, which was the, the major brand of the company and very well known across the world. Um, so at that time I joined, uh, I was involved in the, um, the Skynet 5 project, the, the space, the, the UK military uh, communication constellation. And this is where I really discovered the, uh, you know, the fascinating aspect of of space and the, the very wide variety of um, of activities and the intellectually fascinating aspects of this, these activities. 
I always had a very keen interest in space because I, I love astronomy. I have a telescope. I spent you know nights watching stars and constellations uh, from my house in the countryside. So I, I love this, but you know I, I didn't practice uh, law uh, and space law. I used to be a project finance lawyer working on infrastructure projects, but not space. So I really discovered this when I joined Airbus. And I discovered, how, you know, it's, it's great because it's a mix of cutting edge technology with very complex physics. Uh, you know, if you think about how complex it is for space rendezvous, for two space objects to, uh, to, to meet uh, and to be connected. Uh, and a lot of other aspects like insurance, liability, um, and it's very broad from, you know, international law with the space treaties to local public laws, national space laws and regulations, and a lot of other regulatory, industrial regulations, environment, etc. So it's, it's very rich, it's very broad, so I really enjoyed that, and when I discovered this, I really wanted to, to, to do this and to continue doing this. So for me, it's a perfect match between various aspects from physics, which I loved because I studied physics um, during my, my studies, to, to business, to finance, to uh, regulatory. So everything is in there. So it's, it's, it's great. And I must say, I above all, this is the interest of the job. But what was great when I joined um, Airbus was that I could work with very passionate engineers and you know, I, I attended uh, a lot of times uh, launches from uh, Les Mureaux. Les Mureaux is a small place near Paris where the uh, Ariane rocket is uh, built. It's built there, then it's sent by boat to the, um, uh, the space port in, in Kourou um, and in French Guiana, and it's assembled there and then it's launched. And the engineers, um, which build the rocket are there and every launch are just broad broadcasted. There is a live broadcast. They follow this so we can attend this with them. We follow the launch. There is a lot of pressure because, you know, when the countdown is reaching, you know, like uh, 20, 19, 10, uh, usually at seven they stop because this is the last moment when they can still fix problems on the rocket. After, when it's six, it's too late. The, the, the rocket has to, to go and to, to be launched. So it stops and there you can feel the pressure because if there is a problem, you know, they cannot afford a problem. Everything has to be perfect. So when there is a problem, they, they are talking together to try to find solutions. And then when it's launched, you know, it's, it's great. So that's, the, you know, you feel the, the pressure, you feel the passion. And this is, I really enjoyed that. This is probably what I enjoy more in this, uh, in this uh, job and in what I did. So that was, you know, part of this job and very interesting. And then, as you said, I had the opportunity to uh, work as an advisor to UNIDROIT for the negotiation of the space protocol of the Cape Town Convention. So for those who don't know what it is, the, the Cape Town Convention is an international convention dealing with security of uh, mobile assets. Um, this is, uh, it's been put in place to facilitate the financing of mobile assets. So basically these are aircraft, rail stock and space objects. The reason being that since these objects are mobile, it's difficult to take security in one jurisdiction because if they move to the next jurisdiction, you cannot repossess them. So you need to have an international framework to cover this. So it was put in place for aircraft very successfully. It's working very well for aircraft. And UNIDRA wanted to implement this for space objects as well. Um, but it's a bit different for space objects. And uh, in particular, because they are not uh, going across various jurisdictions, they're in space. And there is no um, you know, concept, ownership concept or repossession concept. So you have to work with different tools. And at the time, the operators and the manufacturers was, and even the some of the, the lenders were against it because they thought it wouldn't work and would create an extra layer of complexity. Uh, but finally, it was adopted in Berlin in 2012 and I participated to all the discussions uh, on this. And it was really also very interesting to see how these instruments uh, are adopted, how they're discussed, 
how they take into account the various interests from the industry, from uh, you know, large, com large countries, uh, spacefaring countries, the developing countries, the financiers, everything together. And the role of Unidraw was not easy to find a middle of the road solution acceptable to everybody to have uh, an instrument which could work and at the same time we could satisfy the interest of uh, all, the, all the players and all the participants. It was a, a great experience. Um, and you know this is part of the, the things we can do with space. And I think this is, uh, you find this in, in no other sector. Thank you very much for that. Um, our next question is, what is the nature of the work that you do within aviation, space and defense? Are the cases that you deal with quite similar or different from one another? Um, well, I'm, you know, I'm advising uh, various types of clients um, from governments and space agencies to uh, operators, manufacturers, uh, financiers, investors, and even new space companies. So it's a very, very wide spectrum of, of clients and of activities. This is one of the nice things of this job because uh, I can work with basically all the players in the space uh, activity uh, and in, in very diverse um, activities and, and fields. So for instance, I'm doing, I'm doing some regulatory uh, matters. I'm currently advising the, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia for the adoption of its national space law. Uh, it was a great, uh, you know, great work we did uh, with them to try to find the right um, applicable regime and, and to, to draft this, this law. We also work for uh, space agencies uh, to implement their, their specific regulations on, on very special specific topics. Uh, and we've just been appointed to advise the European Commission uh, regarding the implementation of, of uh, its space policy. So we have, uh, you know, it's, it's very nice because we, we work on the uh, implementation of all the regulation from nearly from the treaties to the, the really the, the regulation. We also work on commercial negotiations for manufacturers, for uh, operators, manufacturing contracts, subcontracting, launch contracts. Um, we also work on spectrum and frequencies where we advise companies for their filings or specific questions they might have. Um, for instance, we, we work on aero connectivity. So this is the connection of aircraft to satellite uh, to, to, so that the, the aircraft can provide, well, be connected, but also they can provide uh, Wi-Fi services uh, within the aircraft. And here it's very complex because the aircraft is moving from one place to another, to one jurisdiction to another. So in terms of regulation, it's, it's quite complex because there is no international uniform legal regime. So also very interesting. We, we work for financiers. We, we do some financing. I, I, I finance some satellites um, working for banks to, to secure the, the, the financing, uh, dealing with a lot of aspects, including looking at the risks with due diligence negotiating the, the direct agreements with the manufacturers, with the operators. So we, we do all these kinds of things. And uh, last but not least, we also work on, on litigation and arbitration, uh, either in terms of contract for subcontract for some, some aspects or even for, for space, uh, space matters. And we were involved in you know, nearly any aspect necessary, including uh, also Sometimes IP, we work on you know intellectual property issues, which are very specific for space assets, as you can imagine, MA transactions and, and 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 everything. Basically, we do everything for our clients in space. We you know we know the sector, so we can help them maybe more accurately than than others, and, and we, we really enjoy that. Thank you very much. Um, the next question that we had was, um, how are international law firms responding to the commercialization of space? Is Bird and Bird unique in any way they approach their issues? Mm. So, you know, commercial, commercialization of space, which, uh, you know, we, we, call, we call new space, even if the, the term is probably not uh, completely accurate, but uh, is raising really fascinating uh, legal issues. 
um, because space law initially was created by governments for governments. And you know the space treaties were negotiated by by government, and even some of the governments, you know, only a few countries at that time. Um, and you know there was no real issue between them. They because if there was an issue, it was negotiated at diplomatic level, so it was not a legal issue. And at the time, I don't think a lot of legal uh, law firms were involved. It was more government business. And then, you know, the first private actors were under the umbrella of governments and space agencies, uh, either operators or manufacturing companies. So again, the law was not really impacted at that time. But it's then, uh, you know, over the last 15, 20 years, probably, if we go very far, with the, you know, the emergence of new private players, uh, and new commercial activities, then the rules of the game have changed. Um, it started probably earlier than, you know, usually we think about SpaceX, but even before you had uh, private uh, operators uh, all around the world operating telecommunication uh, satellites. So, they, and at that time, you know, there was a need for, for new, uh, new regulations. And that was the beginning of the commercialization of space. So it's not just, it, it, with SpaceX, it was probably a bit older than that. But it's true that now we, we are in a different uh, environment because with the, the development of new small players, uh, you know, with the, the, the cost of launches, which are really decreasing, uh, basically anybody can send space objects in space. So it's, it's a really different uh, environment. And it's, it's difficult for regulators, well, first they have to put in place regulations because they have this international liability um, from the space treaties uh, applying to these private um, activities. And they need to regulate this. They, they have an obligation under the space treaties and also they need to do this to protect their own interests. So they need to do this, but at the same time, the difficulty for them will be to find the right balance between uh, regulating and keeping the freedom of, of commerce and of, of business. So here, yeah, I think we, we are ideally placed to help them because we, we work with the various players, as I said, from the, the governments to the new space companies. So we know the issues. We know what is important for the sec private sector to, to be able to do business. So we can adequately uh, advise the governments and tell them, what they should do or what they shouldn't do if they want to attract investors. Uh, and we can also help the, uh, the players because we have good connections with government space agencies so we can help them find the right, uh, the right approach. So I think this is how we, we want to, to help and how we, why we are unique because we, we, first we know the sector, we know very well. And then since we work for all the players, we have a global view on, on what's going on and and it's it's really good to to be able to, to advise the the various uh, companies or the various players thank you very much for that um the next question is um what are your thoughts on countries creating military forces exclusively for space i think um well you know this is a, a global trend uh, at the moment, um, there is a you know general principle of a peaceful use of space derived from the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, uh, Article Four, um, which was signed during the Cold War. What well, is interesting because you know there is this uh, this aspect of a peaceful use, uh, and I think it's no no surprise that this was. Uh, put in place during the Cold War. So this is generally, generally admitted and accepted. Um, however, um, there are military activities in space um, and space is used for military operations like secure communications. I mentioned the Skynet 5. There, is a, there are a few others you know, uh, all around the world uh, for communications. This is for military communications. So the the governments know that space is, is, uh, is very important for, for the, the defense of their own uh, interest. Also, Earth observations, when you think that 
um, uh, you look at the, the recent conflicts, um, I think most of them uh, used the uh, Earth observation. So, you know, this is key, space is key for, for military, uh, military aspects. Uh, it's a key element of the space strategy. And I think uh, the, the, the new developments, and especially the fact that some countries like the United States, uh, France, and now the United Kingdom, Italy, are creating space commandment. So they're integrating the space activity in their own forces. This is a new development because I think they've understood and they've taken into account that um, they need space to protect the countries. Uh, because space is key, is key for the economy, uh, for the life of the citizens. I mean, we all use devices uh, which are connected to space, like just the GPS is one example. Uh, so we, we, we need this and it's key for, for, the, for the, the economy of the countries, but also for the protection of the country. And, you know, they I think uh, they discovered that now you can send some spy satellites and, you know, some of the, the satellites, for instance, in, in France were approached by uh, spy satellites. And at that time, they, I think the government reacted and said, well, we, then we need to take some measures. It's not uh, active measures. I mean, it's not, we will not send weapons in space, but we need to protect our own interest and our own satellites. And so the idea is that space should be taken into account in the global military strategy. And this is why they've uh, created those military commandments. But of course, um, this does not mean, and I think it shouldn't mean, that governments will place weapons in, in, in space, because this would be completely unlawful, contrary to the space treaties, and this should be prevented at any cost. Um, so that, you know, space should not become the next battlefield. We, we don't want this, and, and this should be avoided. And I think there is a general agreement, understanding about this, even if a few countries don't want to mention any, but have uh, tried to destroy satellites, not just try, they have destroyed satellites in the low uh, Earth orb orbit. Um, although the official purpose was not military, they said, well, no, it's just because, you know, that was the, the best way to do it. Uh, I think the, the purpose, the real purpose was to show that, you know, if it come, came to worse, they could just destroy objects in space and satellites. And I think this is the, the, the risk that we are facing and this should be avoided but you know space will of course be used for uh, military activities and will be taken into account in the global military uh, strategy thank you um what are the most some of the most fascinating case that you've personally worked on um i would say the the most interesting um case i had to work on was what I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, drafting of uh, national space law. Because that's, you know, it was really very interesting. First to draft a law, you know, when you draft a law, you have the impression that you, you're like, a, you know, you, you create the world. I mean, you put in place the framework. So it's, it's that, that will be uh, used for years. So that's, that's very, uh, you know, for a lawyer, it's great. I mean, you create the rules. Usually you, you interpret the rules, you follow the rules, but there you create the rules. So it's, it's, you know, it's wonderful to be able to do this. Um, but I think the most interesting aspect of this was that, as I mentioned, I mean, we, we have to find the right balance between the regulation, which is protecting the interest of the country uh, in particular, because a country has this international liability and we need to make sure that the activity in the country will be in line with these um, international obligations. Um, so that's very important to regulate and make sure that the citizens and the activities on the territory are conducted in line with these uh, obligations. But at the same time, the, the idea was also, and is also for governments to try to attract business. So it's not just regulating, it's also creating an economic uh, environment which will be favorable for the development of business. And when you know that, you know, especially in new, new space companies, but not only, uh, when they want to develop a new activity, they do some forum shopping. So they come to us basically and they say, well, you know, I want to do 
this kind of activity in orbit service or new uh, small launchers, etc. Where should I do it? Because where is the best uh, place to do this? So we advise them, you know, we, we do some benchmarking and we tell them, look, in this country, it's probably more favorable for you. And, and, you know, they are very mobile, so they can move from one country to another. So there is a kind of competition between countries to track business. So it's very interesting when you, you can draft these regulations because you can explain to the countries or to the governments that they should put in place um, legal regimes which are uh, economically very favorable to uh, operators or to company to, to help them uh, attract investors, industry and develop a space sector. So, you know, th this is this mix, which was really fascinating and very interesting because it's, uh, we, we had to regulate the sector and at the same time create a very favorable environment for uh, economic development. Thank you. Um, on the 23rd of September, the International Space Station was forced to move to avoid debris. You noted that there is an urgent need for more international cooperation on this matter, which is a sentiment that we've heard frequently. Do you believe that space space debris is an issue that we will be able to fix, or is it inevitable that the low Earth orbit will be unusable? Hmm. Well, I, I'm, I'm op optimistic on this issue. Uh, I, I want to be optimistic uh, because the, the management of debris is, you know, is one of the main challenges that the industry and the governments will have to face, uh, will face uh, over the next decades. Um, you know, Everyone knows that because of the increasing increasing traffic in the especially in the low Earth orbit or, or the, the risk of collision either with existing debris or with other space objects, uh, you know, is unfortunately increasing, uh, and that that's a given. I mean, it's uh, you know, and and if this were to happen, it already happened because you you, you remember this. Uh, um, accident between two satellites, one, one Russian satellite and one uh, American uh, a few years ago. Uh, when this happens, then the number of debris will increase exponentially. So, you know, there is a, there is a risk and unfortunately, this is something we, we need to face. Uh, up to now, we've managed to, to avoid this, but this, this might happen. But I believe it is still time to react. Uh, you know, to, to find solutions. I'm not sure that a treaty will be possible because a treaty when, you know, I had this experience during the negotiation of the, the space, uh, space convention, it takes a lot of time. You have to make sure you can take into account the interests of various parties. And in, in this aspects, I think the interests of the various parties are, are, are not aligned. So it will be very difficult, I'm not sure that the, the, the countries will sign a, a treaty or would even ratify it. So I'm not sure. And, and, you know, there is a kind of urgency. I mean, we cannot wait 10 years to put in place a treaty. So we need to react. So I don't think this is the, the, the best way to handle the issue. And that's why I mentioned, I think the, the best way to handle that is probably through soft law uh, and through cooperation. Amazingly, uh, and I think for lawyers, it's, it's, I find this very amazing that especially in the space sector it's probably unique uh you know there are a lot of soft law and uh, you know documents uh, guidelines which are in place uh and which are followed by most of the of the, the the players in space even though they are not binding as such they are not treaties they are not really binding instruments but they are followed um that's very interesting because it, it shows that there is a, an understanding that we need to follow certain rules. We cannot do whatever we want. We need to follow certain rules because otherwise we will face big problems. And this is why I'm optimistic that we, we, we may be able to find solutions. Um, there are, you know, space activities, of course, must be regulated and controlled um, by, by governments. This is all, you know, this has been repeated several times by the, especially the UN Office for Outer Space Affairs, they all, you know, claiming that uh, governments should uh, regulate and uh, make sure that the, the rules are, are followed. Uh, but the, uh, you know, a lot of the um, space activity is based on, on principles. So you have the, you, you know, the uh, 
uh, IADC guidelines, which are the, the main guidelines for, for debris, and adopted in 2007. And today they are the main reference for this. Uh, but the, the um, UN Office for Outer Space Activity, uh, Affairs also enacted guidelines for long-term sustainability of space last year. So there are rules. These rules are not binding as such, but they are followed. And I hope that there will be um, uh, you know, the awareness about this issue will raise and that the, the, the governments will uh, you know, make sure that these rules are, are followed. The reason why I, I believe that um, we probably there will be there will be solutions is because when when you think about the the environment and the global warming, uh, you know, like I know twenty years ago it was just a, an issue uh, among specialists, and now it's it's something that you know everybody uh, are you know aware of and and making efforts to preserve this, and. You know, when, when you believe that you need to take care of the earth and make sure that, you know, there will be a long-term sustainability, then the next province is just the low orbit. Because, you know, if you preserve the earth, but you don't preserve the low orbit, then you will face problems. So there will be some understanding uh, of this and, and probably, uh, um, you know, for, for the public. Uh, now you, you read more and more articles about space debris. So I think there is a global understanding and I hope that this will lead to um, politicians um, making, you know, taking seriously this issue. So this is why I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm confident about this, that this can be solved, but it can only be solved at political level, probably not with treaties, but more with guidelines followed and a strict uh, national regulations. Thank you very much for that. Um, this Next question isn't really space related, but we were intrigued by the unique experience that you've had. Uh, can you please tell us about your time in the Japanese parliament and how you became a reserve officer in the Air Force? Well, when I, when I started um, my, my career, I had the opportunity to work in, in Japan. I, I studied uh, in, in Japan and then I had the opportunity to work for a, a member of parliament. And it was in the uh, late 1980s, so it was some time ago. And uh, at that time, there were very few foreigners in Japan. Japan was a very closed country. Uh, we were only uh, four or five, and the others were American. So I was the only European. Um, and it was a great, great experience to, to be able to work, to discover this fascinating country first. Um, and, and second, to work in a, a very close environment because the political sphere was, uh, as I said, completely Japanese, closed. And to be able to discover this was well, probably one of the greatest experience in, in my life. And even now in what I'm doing, you know, I think uh, I have a lot of reactions which are guided by this, uh, this experience. So it's, it's really, it's, it's great, uh, great uh, experience and opportunity I had. And when I came back after this, um, I uh, worked a few years in the for the Air Force uh, in in France. Um, you know, we at that time we had to to spend um, a few months uh, at least uh, in the uh, in the army, and I decided to to spend more time, but to become an officer and and to work on uh, you know some interesting aspects. I was um, part of the, uh, the procurement department working on. Uh, procurement issues and and uh, for for the for the air force, but I at that time I had the opportunity to meet uh, pilots to to see I was on a, a military base so I could see the aircraft it was you know it was great it's also the beginning of the reason why I love this uh, you know space and and uh, and and the the aeronautics it you know it comes from from this uh, this time it's, uh, you know I think everything for me in what I'm doing is uh, around the passion I have. For doing this. Thank you. Um, the final question that we had was, um, what are your thoughts on space tourism and its feasibility? Mm. It's a nice question. It's uh, I, I really enjoy uh, you know space space tourism. I 
I worked on a, a nice project when I was at Airbus. Um, at that time, Airbus wanted to develop a um, an aircraft or a spacecraft. You, you know, it's, it was a mix of uh, aircraft and spacecraft. It was a, an aircraft with a rocket engine. Um, te technically, it was extremely complex just to put the rocket engine on an aircraft. It completely changed the, the nature of the aircraft and the engineers were working very hard to find solutions. Um, the idea was that the aircraft would, you know, just take off like a normal aircraft and when they would reach a certain altitude, they will just launch the rocket engine, go into space, more than 100 kilometer, and then come back. Um, and this would, you know, last five, six minutes, but, you know, you could have like five, six participants. They could go into space and really see the Earth from, from that place. And the idea was to finance this, or well, to develop it first, to finance it, and then to commercialize it. Um, so it was a very interesting project because you had all the aspects of this project from the technology aspects to the commercial aspect to financing, all the risks, the insurance. So it was, you know, covering everything. The problem is for space tourism uh, that, you know, one, one of the main problems is it's very risky. I mean, even if engineers are wonderful, they can develop new solutions, they can find very uh, good products, they can develop good products, but still, I mean, space is risky. And we, we see that, uh, you know, every, every day, you can see, you know, just uh, last week, one of the, the rockets, the Vega rockets just exploded. Um, and, you know, this is part of this, the nature of this activity. So for space tourism, you need to keep that in mind, because it's not just like, going for a flight uh, you know, from London to, to, to New York. I mean, it's different. And, and you know, we need to keep that in mind, especially for the public, because the first time there will be a problem with a space tourism uh, aircraft. This will be really, uh, will have a, a, a big impact on, on this activity. Um, so that, that's the first part. The second thing is that it's not completely in line with the environmental concerns because space is not yet a green activity. And you know, this was one of the main reasons why Airbus decided to put this project on hold because uh, you know, they thought that developing this at a time when everybody wants to do green uh, activities would probably not be in line with the public expectations. And then it is very complex from a regulatory and, and, and safety point of view, because now we see some countries developing new regulations, but it's not yet regulated. And so you need to think of how you, you, you will you know, develop this and, and, and what needs to be done to, to, to do this in line with the, the regulation to make sure it's safe and, uh, and to be able to develop it. And especially when you want to finance it, uh, the, the, the lenders or the investors are looking at this very carefully because they don't want to take any any risk uh, because it's not their job, but also they don't want to be held liable for any problem that might arise. So for me, to, to just to sum up and answer your question, I think space tourism will develop in the next years or decades. There is no doubt about this, but we should keep in, in mind that it is it is risky and that there are a lot of things that need to be to be regulated. But you know, I do hope that one day we will be able to uh, to travel in space, to afford a, a, a travel in space, and and get this great view of the Earth from from space. So I'd like to thank you very much for this experience, and I found it very insightful, and I'm sure that our viewers will too. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for giving me the opportunity uh, of doing this this broadcast. It was very interesting. Yeah.